Preston, also Seth Priest and Ken Hill. Um, our speaker is Dr. Joan Markle, who is the curator of our permanent exhibit called The Battle of Four Standards, November 29, 1863. It's uh, right outside this uh, room here, so if you haven't seen it, we invite you after the lecture to spend a little time uh, browsing there. And I'd also like to remind you that on John, can we have some more volume, please? I'd also <laughs> like to remind you that on April the 22nd, the fourth in this series will be held. Dr. Earl Hess will be here uh, speaking on the Knoxville campaign. And uh, Joan does have a microphone. <laughs> so I love without you. further ado, <laughs> I will turn it over to her. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the mic's on. Is that better? Can you hear me in the back? And man on the, that's all right? Okay? A bit louder. All right. Do you know how to turn the volume up, Debbie? <laughs> I've got these power packs. <laughs> I don't know which one is which. Ah. All right, is this better? Is it louder? Can, if I talk, I'll keep talking. Is that any louder? doesn't sound louder to me. All right. That one says green. That one says green. Oh, that's a, there we go. That's better. All right, thank you. Okay. We can make it, is that Maybe I should talk like this. There we go. <laughs> all right. I will, yeah, I know. I will remember to talk down like this, all right? Or maybe I might even do this. Now, I don't want to talk too close because then it sputters. All right. That's good? You hear me up in the back? Thank you. All right. Debbie and I are frequently mistaken for each other. You can imagine we, we are uh, similar, and, uh, but uh, Debbie's a, uh, our wonderful assistant director here at the museum. Now, I, I am going to show you pictures of Knoxville that I have been out taking. I am a person who uh, has found the history of our town and my town now since 1990 to be absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to talk about not just the real history, but also the history we all think we know, the stories that we've heard, and um, some of the ways I've gone looking after the fact versus the story, and uh, what we've got left here on the ground. Um, as you can see, in the 1890s, uh, Knoxville was attempting to get away from its past. The horrors, the, the memories, the recent unpleasantness, all of that was, as they said here, the dead and buried past. It might be still a cherished remembrance, but it's a dead ideal, I think referring to that's a concession to the, to the war. And while the new is at once its hope and its pledge of future advancement. This is what Knoxville wanted to be seen as in the 1890s, progressive, uh, modern, looking to the future, a, a, a perfect example of the new South. Therefore, Historic preservation obviously was not something that people were putting into the forefront. It was something they were leaving behind. They thought of the scars of war. They thought of the fortifications and the physical remembrances as something that needed to be buried over, covered over, covered with the new, the progressive, the moving forward. However, there are many structures in our community, I'm going to be talking about Knox County as a whole, um, where we can find the places and put together the story of the places and the people of 61, 1861 to 1865. And as I said, it's often said that our Civil War past has been lost to time. However, Knoxville is extremely well documented. And by putting together the facts gleaned from rich and diverse sources, it's possible to begin to reconstruct the family stories of 1861 to 65. And one key way to look at it, one perspective, 
is by locating the places where people lived and then pulling together the records that were left behind by the people who lived there. It's the accident of preservation of physical structures, plus the availability of written accounts naming locations that allow us to recreate the stories of Knox County civilian population in their own settings. And it, this is a, a very big civilian story. However, it is also intermixed with the military events and the way that the military left behind the record of 1861 to 65. Once again, Orlando Poe, I know you've all heard me talk about him. Uh, he is the man who documented our area so well for us. He documented it with maps and with photographs and with diaries. His, his individual daily log as he marched from Kentucky to Knoxville and then from Knoxville to Clinton and all over East Tennessee, every day he was measuring distances, he was writing down family names, he wrote down features like the creeks and the fords and the ferries and the islands and all of that information is captured in his own hand. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name names in the crowd too. Art Barker up there has been, what? Your voice is Am I fading? fading? I can't hear you up there, Gary. Sorry. All right, is this better? Put it down. Stable. All right, like this. All right, I'll, just, I'll talk down like this. Is this good? All right, <laughs> okay. Paul, uh, Art Barker has been traveling around the Clinton area using the Poe diaries and maps, finding the places that Poe noted on his map, the, the family homes, the bridges, the routes that were there prior to the present day, and it's all very accurate. As I understand, right, Art? It's, he's, he's had hours and days of fun following these old maps and finding out the first-hand personal account of the history on the ground as Poe saw it in 1863. Um, of course, all the military records, the official records, the uh, things that are written in report form, um, but also the soldiers' individual accounts. Many soldiers who were here left individual accounts and then wrote books. E. Porter Alexander wrote a book. Moxley Sorrell wrote a book. Longstreet, Grant, um, even Poe has several published papers on the Civil War. So all of those accounts are, they, they name places, they name families. But we have, obviously, and this is, this is should, doesn't need to be said, but Knoxville was a perfectly functioning historic town when the war arrived and continued to be when the war left. This was a four-year window in our local history. And our city directories were published uh, every 10 years, well, depends. They were published uh, not exactly as regularly as the census and sometimes closer together. But we also have census information from 1850 and every 10 years. So we've got names, we've got physical addresses, we've got street plans, we've got wonderful what they call bird's eye view maps of this area in, in 1871, 1889, and again you can see the detail of the homes in which these people live, but, you, but it's never all in one place, it's not all compiled together, and that's what I'm trying to do is to pull together the visuals and then the stories that go along with them. Um, early photographs, indeed we have a very good history of Knoxville in photographs. And then, of course, we've got the civilian letters and diaries, and uh, civilian and military. A lot of the uh, soldiers, the, the uh, soldiers in the ranks writing home, would write about the places where they were, the family names of the people that they met and recognized. Knox Heritage, one of our very fine uh, Knoxville organizations, and I'm sure most of you know of Knox Heritage's work and may uh, be members. Kim Trent has done a phenomenal job with the physical uh, remains of our historic time period, not just Civil War, but of course Civil War is part of it. And Knox Heritage is an excellent place to learn more about what we have to say. Um, our Metropolitan Planning Commission, there's a website all about historic preservation designated sites. You can get online and look at the sites that are recognized by address, and they've done fine work over the years locating these places and helping with the preservation. Where do we find the stories? 
Well, the Calvin McClung Collection downtown, it's in the same building as the East Tennessee Historical Society. It's part of the Knox County Library System. And Steve Cottom, who's the director there, is a, 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 an amazing storehouse of information of Knoxville history, Knox County history. We've got special collections at University of Tennessee. A wonderful primary collection of documents and photographs and information that's been kept and saved. Uh, it, it was originally written down by people here in many cases and then saved by the university. We have other kinds of that same information here at the McClung Museum. East Tennessee Historical Society, wonderful exhibits, programming all about our history. But also in the national level, we've got Library of Congress and the National Archives. This is where Orlando Poe, for instance, donated all of his material on East Tennessee, and the primary data is still there. And multiple university and state libraries all over Virginia, Duke, um, Michigan. There are places where the soldiers who were here donated their papers, and they can be located and studied. Also, family stories all around Knoxville. You've talked to people who've had family here, who had ancestors here during those years. Some of them have family stories which are remarkable. Some of the family stories turn out to be actually things that match up with the historic record. Other stories don't quite match the historic record. And in some cases, you can't really know which is, which is really the accurate account. You can't assume, because it got written down in the official records, for instance, that it's absolutely accurate. Uh, sometimes, you know, the victors get to write the history. That's always been true. And that may be true in some of the situations where our folk history disagrees with our official history. And that's, that's, that's what I mean. Our popular culture, the stories that we hear around town, like everybody knows there was a cave down on the shore of the river and that the slaves could come by the uh, um, Underground Railroad and come up through the cave system and hide in the houses. Well, everybody that you hear tell the story hasn't really seen that cave system themselves. But they have a friend who, who's been in it, and they're sure it's there. And so far, they, now there are cisterns, and of course, East Tennessee has caves all over. But that particular story matched up with the physical evidence of a cave and an exit to the river. That's never been confirmed. Now, if anybody here knows of it, Maybe as, as young people, you went crawling through it, and you know it's there. I would love to hear about it. But it's, again, one of those stories that's out there, and um, so far I haven't been able to confirm it. Now, just a little mini military lesson. There were two times in Knoxville history when uh, we were pretty much under attack. First time in June 1863, Colonel, then Colonel William P. Sanders, comes down with cavalry, 1,500 cavalry uh, from Kentucky. He, this is pretty much overshadowed by the Battle of Gettysburg and the victory at Vicksburg. Um, it would have received a whole lot more national attention because it was one of the first uh, raids into East Tennessee from Kentucky, one of the first raids into the South by Union cavalry. There was one earlier. There was Carter up in Bluntsville and, and uh, further up along the uh, Virginia border. But this was right down to our town. And um, uh, again, it did not receive the national attention it might have if it hadn't been for these other events. There were 1,500 troopers and artillery. They came down from Kentucky they, at Wartburg. They captured a number of CSA troops. Um, they went to Lenore Station, burned the mill, and advanced on Kingston Pike. They tore up the railroad track where they could, and they cut the telegraph lines. And their whole purpose was sabotage, basically, to, to let the East Tennesseans, uh, Confederates, know that the Union was alive and well over the border. Um, he was sent down here by Burnside, who wanted to come down in larger numbers, but was being delayed for various reasons. Anyway, he did destroy railroad and telegraph lines. On the way, coming down Kingston Pike, this is when Dr. Harvey Baker was killed at his home, and I'm going to tell you more details about that. Anyway, he shelled Knoxville on June the 20th. Uh, he was basically out at Broadway and Fifth. It's called Taswell Road at the time. Taswell is, of course, out that way. So Broadway and the name Taswell was applied to, to uh, what we call Broadway now. And he burned the bridge at Strawberry Plains and Flat Creek, and he had a harrowing escape trying to get back up to Kentucky. But he did manage to do that, and there are very, it's a large account. There's a large 
uh, report in the official records of all that Sanders did on this raid. Now, the other major event came in uh, November, December of 63. So this is about six months later. And this is when General Longstreet, who's down in Chattanooga, he is sent up here by President Davis and General Bragg. November 12th, all of his troops finally unload at Sweetwater. There are no provisions. They have to spend a little bit of time foraging because they didn't get the provisions they were supposed to. He didn't have an accurate map. And this proves to be critical in what happens later. And the large railroad bridge at Loudoun, which is still it's back, it was burned several times. What happened, though, when the, under Buckner in September, August, end of August, September, the Confederates left Knoxville, went down to Chattanooga, and uh, they burned the bridge behind them. And it had been a Union target all along. It, it was uh, uh, unfortunate for the Confederates coming back this way then that there is no bridge across the river, the Tennessee River, into uh, Knox area. So they, did not, they knew it was out, though. So they brought a pontoon bridge with them, which they put in at Huff's Ferry. They crossed Huff's Ferry. And so the Confederates are now moving west across Kingston Pike. Kingston, everybody, obviously, it's called Kingston Pike because it goes to Kingston. Um, what the, Confe the Union is doing, Burnside has taken Knoxville in September. And then he spread out. He sends his troops out around East Tennessee. He has a fair number down in Loudoun. They have uh, actually built their cabins with roofs and chimneys, and they are settled in for a very nice winter in East Tennessee, and they're comfortable. Uh, and all of a sudden, they get the order, oops, move. You got to go back to Knoxville. So uh, they are pulled back. Longstreet, him, uh, Burnside himself. And I want you to know, that because you know, everybody in the room here may know the story, but when I first started to learn about East Tennessee history, Civil War, I couldn't, fi I couldn't remember which side they were on. You know, these names are not, it's not like the Second World War, where if your name is Yamamoto, it's probably you're on the other side. It's not quite that way here. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily true either. That's, I hope that doesn't sound inappropriate, but, but you know, it's, um, there were certainly many fine Japanese Americans at the time. So, but nevertheless, we, we tend to objectify the, uh, the enemy in a war. And in this war, the Civil War, you cannot just read a name and make an assumption about which side they're on. So I've put the names of the Unionists in blue and the Confederates in uh, kind of a gold. All right? Anyway. Burnside gets on the train here in town. He goes to Lenore City. He's not going to go to Loudoun because he can't, the, river, the bridge is no longer there. He, his troops are so invigorated when he shows up. They were not happy. The weather was horrible. It was raining. This was not something they thought was ever going to happen. And they were, it was just a mess of mud and discouragement. And when Burnside showed up. There are many accounts of common soldiers saying, this guy's great. We, we just picked up people. The mood lightened. The, the pace quickened. The step was people. The soldiers were very much inspired by his presence. His plan was to keep Longstreet up here, keep him away from Chattanooga. He was willing to sacrifice his own troops. Uh, he, in fact, uh, it's, a, it's a race to Campbell Station. And he has uh, conferred with General Grant. He and Grant had an instant rapport. And you know, as I looked at that, I couldn't figure out how to spell rapport. If that's wrong, please forgive me. But at any rate, they, it's wrong. Yeah, I know. It's, it's like, that's maybe, well, anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> if you don't point out your own spelling areas, errors, somebody else will. So anyway, the uh, artillery battle happened at Kingston Pike and Turkey Creek. And the Federals beat the Confederates to that intersection by about 15 minutes. And according to Dr. Earl Hess, who's going to be next month's speaker and, and just one of the best military historians, Civil War historians in the country, he says the whole camp pretty much decided right there at Campbell Station. Here is a great map. This was done by Steve Dean, a four-hour uh, DVD. The, the, uh, called it the Memory Alone Remains. But here you can see that here is the, the Confederates. Are, well, Confederates, let's do it this way, are coming up from... Uh, the river crossing here at, you see that? No, it's not very good, is it? There it is. This is not very, they're crossing the river here at Huff's Ferry. They're divided into two 
and they're going to go, but you see they're all converging. And what happens is the Union gets to Campbell Station first. That means they can throw up their artillery lines and they hold back the Confederates. The blue line goes behind their own artillery. They make it into Knoxville and that's where the, no the siege begins. Now, I hope everybody here already knew most of that because there's no way you're going to retain it all from that quick overview. But that gives you an idea of what the military is doing and also why it's the Union that holds the town and the Confederates that are, are attacking. People are always con confused. They say, this is a town in Tennessee. And why is it not being attacked by the Union? Well, in fact, the Union walked in without a fight in September when the Confederates evacuated. And then the, down in Chattanooga, that's a whole other story, they decide, oops, we, we, we need to get Knoxville back. We've got to go back up and take Knoxville. And that's when this happens in November. All right. The Federals march down Kingston Pike to the safety of fortifying Knoxville. They hold out through the siege and the assault. The Confederates pursue, engage General Sanders in his last stand. They dig in. They attack on November 29th. The attack fails. Then they pull out for parts east December 4th. So these are the major military events. I mean, this, this town's at war for four years, but these are the times when there are armies here that are ba doing, doing battle. Now this, I've got to show you, this is a wonderful new, there we go. Uh, I'm just going to put this down. I've got to show you, this is that map that Orlando Poe did of Knox County. And Charles Reeves, who's here in the audience, has enhanced it so that we can read it better than we could and he's put a grid pattern on it and I have some undergraduate students who are going to go through this map square by square and write down the family names write down the churches write down the sawmills and the grist mills and the, the ferries and the islands anything that's on there as a label and we'll put it into a little database a little spreadsheet make it searchable so that this information is, you don't just have to sit there and read, the, and it's a big, obviously big map, but watch what happens when we go in and I can't do this too fast or the machine will choke. All right, now we're going to go down to Clinch River. And we're going to go All right. This is Campbell Station. This road actually starts down here at the county line. So this says to Lenore's, and this down here says to Loudon, and then we find some homes coming into Kingston Pike. And now we're going to go down Kingston Pike. The troops are going to meet up at Campbell Station. This is Squire Maroney, and I don't know that name yet, but Squire is a county position. It's, it's, a, it's a political office. It means that he has some kind of... Uh, responsibility to the <coughs> governing of the county. Um, I, the Russell House, and we've all heard about the Russell House, is noted here, Tan Yard. Apparently there's some sort of a tannery. And then we've got the road down to Concord. We've got a saw mill, a saw and grist mill here. And this is the railroad. The railroad did not go through Campbell Station. It didn't then, it doesn't now. And of course the old coach road was there. This, is, this was the main way that people got to the west from here before the, uh, before the railroad went in. But the, uh, the inn at Campbell Station um, languished. The, most of the traffic did not go down that road after the railroad went through. So we've got some family names here. We've got something very interesting. As, well, these, every once in a while it tells the mileage to Knoxville. These were almost impossible to read before Charles enhanced the map. Couldn't figure out what this was. I think they were added later. Problem with the map is the original was photocopied, but photographed in 1864. That particular copy is wonderful, but 
it's not as sharp as it should be because it's a copy. The original map was done in ink, and the ink is faded. So that one is not as sharp as it should be. And I was just was talking to Charles beforehand. You know the CSI TV shows when they're looking at something, they said, make that clearer, and all they do is press a button, and it comes <laughs> instantly. They see reflections in mirrors and all of that. Apparently, that doesn't, technology doesn't really exist. Um, so uh, it's not easy to get this as completely uh, translated as we would like to. But what we're going to do, basically, we're going to follow the troops down Kingston Pike and look at the structures that are there today that were there in 1863. And let's see if I can make this all work. Now, all right, we'll go back to the slideshow. All right. Just wanted to show you a little comparison. This, this is a beautiful. This is the way in, in Gettysburg they recognize their Civil War heritage. And here in the state of Tennessee, this is the Chickamauga battlefield. There you go. Battle of Campbell Station. <laughs> Makes you proud, doesn't it? But the, the town of Farragut has absolutely done wonderful things recently. Farragut Folklife Museum, there's a, a wonderful new director there. Well, the old director was also great, but Julia, has, had, Julia Jones has just brought some new ideas in and, and has really um, worked with the collections and the history. And of course, there is this amazing park. Has everyone seen this, the Farragut Park out there? The, uh, the beautiful statue of Farragut. Um, these are authentic cannon from his flagship. The, that, the people who put this together, I know uh, John, you know the man who was responsible on the committee to do this. this. This is just amazing that they got this kind of support from the Navy, and this is these are authentic. And uh, Farragut, you know, he is one of the. Um, let's see, where did I say that? He was he's one of the greatest and least controversial heroes of the Civil War. Well, I guess if you're Union, I, I suppose. <laughs> but in any case, people aren't doubting what he did. Taking New Orleans was was an amazing act of courage, and he th th everything he did to do to accomplish his mission at that point, he did well. And so Farragut was was a very much respected Civil War hero. And as I said, now we have this beautiful park, which is right beside the city hall in Farragut. And we have his home on North Shore Drive. Now, I know you read it. This, uh, sometimes this, this may lapse into the stories we all know, or we know parts of them. Everybody may be aware that there is a controversy over the place where he was born. Um, he was actually born near Lowe's Ferry, and we can look at that Poe map. I'm not going to call it back now. Lowe's Ferry is on the map. There's a nice little square where the cabin was, where he was born. So it's really not too much of a mystery where he was born. However, they left Farragut when he was eight years old, and he was in the Navy by nine. So it's not as if he really was formed. His formative years were not exactly spent in Farragut. And, and you know, he did not grow up here. But that doesn't lessen the value of his birthplace, as you know, birthplaces all over the country are something that people recognize. However, um, one problem, very much problem, is it's on private property. And that is, we, you know, that's an issue that we can debate um, high and low as to, as to what does that mean, and, and what do we do with it? But um, back in the 1900, early 1900s, the Daughters of the American, uh, American Revolution actually put a stone marker on the site to commemorate it. Well, the current owner gave the marker away. And we hear that it's in Texas. Now, Tim, Ma Mayor, Mayor Tim Burchett has been talking with the owner, and hopefully there is some kind of an equitable solution. But you think about this. Who owns history? And, oh, as I said, he, this, is, this is a little, the details of the stage, but, but who owns history? And there is work on trying to get an easement to the property and some recognition as to what the site was all about. And it's on the shore, of the and the river, of course, is much higher than it was with the, with the um, um, damming of, of the river. So it's a very interesting case study in historic preservation. And what does this mean to the community? What does it mean to, to uh, whatever we think heritage is and, and how it plays a role in our um, presentation of ourselves, not to just to people coming from
from elsewhere, but to our children and to the people who come, uh, who make Tennessee, East Tennessee their home. Now, this is the Campbell House, or the Campbell Inn, or uh, it's on the corner of Campbell Station. And actually, it's not right on the corner. You see there's a fair amount of land. There's another whole lot over here. But it's on Campbell Station, uh, Kingston Pike at Campbell Station Road. And it was the Campbell House originally, they think. Now, trying to do that kind of historic research is very tedious and time-consuming. You look at deeds, you look at plats, you look at uh, wills, because property is, is, you can try to track where things were in time by who owned them and who left them to their descendants and all that sort of thing. But this is what it looks like. Um, this is a photo was taken in 2006. Now, this is a photograph I took in 2012 looks pretty much the same, right? I'm going to put them side by side, and we're going to do one of those newspaper games. Tell me what's different. <laughs> yeah. The chimneys are gone. And you wouldn't even know. that They were internal, and they were apparently part of the original structure that was the 1800s building, and they're gone. <laughs> Well, probably. And uh, who knows what happened inside. Again, it's private property. It belongs to somebody. It's somebody's home. And it's really up to private individuals what they do with their own property. So when, if, with, if and when it ever becomes part of the public, uh, what, what we hold and take care of and pay for with our taxes, then we can reinforce the, or enforce the particular standard of, of change and whatever. That, and that's what historic overlay is all about. There, there are so many legal issues that are involved with this. I have no expertise whatsoever about. But, but I took these two pictures, and when I looked at it, and I said, what happened to the chimneys? Uh, I don't know, but there it is. And the, you know, the physical evidence is right there. Now, the, this is also from the side. You can see that this structure is not period, and that was added on afterwards. There was a very nice picture done uh, in, by a man named Paul Long. This is a portrait, a painting that was done. Um, it's much bigger, but you can see the Union troops here and then the Confederate troops over here. This is Turkey Creek. This is Kingston Pike. This is the Campbell Russell House. This is the Russell House that's up behind um, the uh, Taco Bell. Now, this one has been beautifully restored. There's an addition over here that matches this, and it's being used as office space. This is a great way to reuse history and, and make it self-supporting. You can now, in this picture here, let's see. All right. You can see the, the Campbell House, the, two, the chim middle chimney and the four windows. If you look at this, you can see the middle chimney the two windows, and there were windows down here that are blocked in. But this painting was done, wait a minute, <laughs> sorry. This painting was done by doing research in the 1980s. So they were not looking at the original structures either. But it's a pretty good um, approximation, and, and, and good research was done to, put, to pr produce this painting. Now, continuing. As I said, both are privately owned. Both have stories of them being used as hospitals. Both report there are bloodstains, original bloodstains from the war. And the Russell family descendants have stories. There are still Russells who live out in Farragut, and they have stories for the family told. And they talk about valuably both being hidden and livestock being hidden. Many of the civilian families had great places to hide their cows and their pigs when the troops came through, or their valuables. Um, and also, there's a story that I've heard, and I have no idea if this is true, but that after the battle, this artillery feud, there were so many um, pieces of shell and, and artillery and, and unexploded and solid, whatever they're shooting around back and forth, that it, they, couldn't pl they couldn't plow. And so they made a concerted effort to clean it all up, and there was a sinkhole under the baseball field at Farragut High School. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> you think anybody's ever going to get permission to, to dig a hole in the middle of the Farragut baseball field? Probably not. But that's a story I heard when I first got here. Um, don't know. Now, there is a very interesting story about General Ferraro. He was actually a dancing master at West Point. 
And then he went out and, you know, he's, he is uh, now a general and apparently has some talent as a general. Um, there is a story by one in one of the regimental histories that say that uh, Ferraro was in one of the Russell houses. And it's confusing because at one point in time, they were both Russell houses, and uh, it's not clear which house they're talking about when you hear some of these story, Civil War stories. But apparently he was having his dinner, and uh, the Confederates arrived, and he stood up and he said, the ball has begun. Well, that doesn't make much sense unless you know that he was a dancing master. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, he, his name comes up. He was inside the fort in Fort Sanders when the battle took place, when the attack was made. And Lieutenant Benjamin, who was an artillerist, he was the one who came up with the idea for the shortened fuses and throwing the hand grenades into the trench. Benjamin says that Fer Ferraro never left the little bomb proof they, they had a telegraph communication inside the fort, so there was a, a, section, a little area there that was, that was very well protected. And Benjamin says that Ferraro just stayed in there the whole time. He never had anything to do with the battle. Uh, and, and I've heard, read other comments on Benjamin's comments that say, well, that's why he never got higher in rank than he did, you know, that he was just critical of his superior officers, and that was... That was, un that was not a good thing to do. Well, then you read that Ferraro was at Petersburg. And at Petersburg, he was also accused of never leaving the bomb proof and also being drunk during the battle. And so you think, well, does, does Benjamin have a point? And again, some of those stories you'll never, ever know the truth of. Um, but it's very interesting to read the different perspectives and the things that give that Russell House a firm Civil War connection. All right, yeah, behavior at Petersburg. And then he did. He went back to New York City after the war, and he ran a dance studio. Or, or, so interesting. Now, this place, have people noticed this one lately? It's kind of be always been there, but, but it, it just seemed like an old house. Well, when that property was sold, and now there's the, uh, uh, the big sports thing back there and a couple of food stores. It's across from uh, Home Depot. And it sits there on the, uh, on the side of the road. It's now for sale. And uh, it originally was, it wasn't built by Be William J. Baker, but it was owned by Baker. It was owned by Baker during the war. It was called Cedar Grove. Knox Heritage gave me this information. It was built in 1849. It was a two-story, three-bay federal-style home. It was in a T shape. Yeah, William J. Baker, who died at age 65 right at the end of the war, he bought it, what was called the Kennedy Estate in 1858. And it, he bought it because it was near the Baker Peters house. And we'll talk about that one too. That's further, just a little further to the east. And he also added one wing uh, on the west as an office. He was a medical doctor. Uh, the, it, there, it was called Cedar Grove, and, and Cedar Springs Presbyterian Church is right there, so we can only assume there were plenty of cedars in the area, maybe there still are. Um, he, he, after he died, he, he, was, uh, he and his wife were childless, and they willed it to the Walker family. So Walker Springs, again, the Walker name is out in that area. Um, it is already, it has an H1 zoning and a commitment to preservation, and um, when they were, the brothers lived out west in this area, they, were a lot, they had a lot of land, a lot of acreage. Um, being from Kentucky may have had an influence on the fact that they kept many fine horses and they were both uh, major slaveholders, which was not common in, in uh, East Tennessee. Um, there it is again. You can see it has issues from the back. But Apparently, it can still be, still be saved if anyone has the desire to put enough money into it to stabilize it and turn it into something either livable or perhaps office buildings. It really is an important home, um, and it's been here all that time. Ac as I said, accident of preservation. You wonder why it hasn't been lived in for quite a while, but there it is. Now, the Baker Peters house, everybody knows this one. Um, this is not... Doesn't look too bad from this way, but look what's going on here. This doesn't even seem to have any mortar in it. Mortar's kind of coming apart here. Down here by the windows, this doesn't look too good. This guy's painting, has a nice new roof, but you can imagine what a maintenance issue someplace like this is. 
And if you look at it, this is the way it really looks. This is from Kingston Pike. Now, I know there was an issue when uh, the gas station went in, and they did manage to save the house. And there was a big tree out front, which fell down. But that really, it, that, it doesn't do justice to, to what the home could be. Now, Abner's Attic. When I got here, there was a restaurant in there called Abner's Attic. And let me tell you the story of the, t the Baker family. This is it. They're, they, I, I've heard bits and pieces of it, and I've tried to pull it together for you. And I'm there I don't have all the details, but this is what it looks like. William Baker, William J. Baker, was a doctor. He was the first of the family to come here. They were from Kentucky. He arrived in 1825, and he set up practice downtown. His brother Leonidas arrived in 1829. Uh, he died before the war, but while he was here, he married the daughter of William and Jane Crozier Armstrong Park. So there are all the old family names of Knoxville in, in one person, and she was his wife. When uh, he died, she married then into the Moses family, and the Moses family had property holdings in uh, what is near, now kind of the Fort Sanders area. Um, James Harvey, who was called Harvey, was a doctor also. He moved down not too long after the other brothers. Uh, he was born in 1811. He died in 1863. Well, that 1863 date is significant. It was this guy who was killed by Sanders' cavalry. Uh, when Sanders was coming from Lenore City, even though the telegraph was out, they managed to get word to Knoxville that the town needed to be defended. And Dr. Harvey Baker was going to Knoxville as a civilian to defend, defend the town. So he gets outside his house and he runs smack into uh, Sanders' cavalry. Now, from that point on, the story just really depends on which side of the war you were on as to what happened. He was either fired on first, unarmed, or he was armed and defending himself, but he probably did go into his house. He was killed in front of his family. Now, the other, another sibling was Elizabeth Baker Crozier. She married into the Crozier family. She married Dr. Carrick Crozier. The time of the war, he was uh, in, this, in the Confederate Army, as was their uh, son who was in his late teens. So this is another, it's, and it's, it's very interesting. Doctors tend to marry into other doctors' families. That's what I found all over Knoxville. For, for whatever reason, maybe that's the people you get to know, but there was a lot of intermarriage between the different doctor families and their children. Anyway, the eldest brother was Caleb. He died in 1863, and he was a unionist. I put, the two, I put Harvey and Elizabeth in gold because they're Confederate sympathizers. Uh, Leonidas was dead, and William... I don't know. He was born in, he was old by the war while well, he was in his 60s. So he was not going to be a, a, a soldier probably, but I don't know what his sympathies were. But Caleb, the eldest brother, was, um, was, a, was a unionist. And Elizabeth left a diary. And after she watched her home being burned, this was during the siege of Knoxville, her home along with the Reese's home and, and several others between Fort Sanders and Crescent Bend. These homes were torched because they were, um, they, the, the sharpshooters were getting into the homes. They had uh, protection and they were picking off the Union troops. So the Union burned these homes. But this quote from Elizabeth is from her diary. She says, my oldest brother, Caleb Baker, a Union man, died during the second year of the war, leaving a widow with several children, the occupants of his beautiful and delightful home on the south side of the river. His widow, a kind and noble-hearted woman, attained a permit to come to town, bringing some provisions. She said to me, bring Kate and Carrick. Now, Elizabeth still had young children, as well as the uh, teenager, late uh, the son in the army, and stay with me. I have plenty for us all now if they will only let me keep it, and as long as I have a dime, I will divide it with you. I know not what I should have done without this great kindness. This is an example of how these families were torn apart by the Civil War here in East Tennessee. Now, Dr. Harvey, as I said, he was killed inside his home with his family present. He was helping, heading to Knoxville to help defend against the Federals. There were no, General Buckner had been in town. He was in Clinton for some reason. And there were about, a, there was one Florida regiment. They took all the, all the prisoners out of the uh, jail. They took the 
uh, patients out of the hospital. They called in all of the, the people in the surrounding countryside, and uh, they managed to defend the town. And this is the action, and uh, if you have heard other of, others of my lecture, this was where Pleasant Miller McC McClung was killed as part of it. This was Frank's cousin. I'm pretty sure Frank was also on the, the lines. I always try to relate everything back to Frank H. McClung being this is part this is his museum. Anyway, uh, Dr. Harvey met the cavalry outside of his home, and there are two very different versions of what happened as to who fired first and, and how he happened to die. But there's no question that he was killed by Union troops. And on the Union, I want, just want to show you this on the map. Uh, here, let's see if we can end this. Put this down, put this beautiful map up again. As we're going down Kingston Pike, you're going to see the the Walker home. Here is the Maybury, no, Mayberry, but it's Maybury. Uh, Maybury, that's the George Washington Maybury was out here. This was where Joseph Maybury's brother was. Um, it says Baker, and for some reason this is on the other side of the road, but with roads, you're not always sure which side. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but this says Widow Baker, W I D Baker. This is because this map was done in November of 63, and her husband was killed in June of 63. So we are now continuing down Kingston Pike, and these homes are marked um, in the, the walkers. Um, I can't read them all, but we're going to be able to read them all before, before this map project is over. In any case, um, let's look at... Now, this is Abner Baker. It's not a good likeness. It was um, a, in a collage of uh, Confederate um, soldiers that is owned by the uh, Daughters of the Confederacy. So this is, this is as close an image as I can get. He was born in 1843, so in 65 when he was killed, he was 22 years old. He had been through the war as a Confederate soldier. He was the son of Dr. Harvey. Abner's Attic. I think they just used that name because of the alliteration. There was some historical significance, but Abner was not killed at, uh, at Baker Peter's house. He was downtown, and it was 1865 after the war, just shortly after the war, and he was in one of the, maybe in the courthouse, and he confronted a man who was, had been a unionist. Um, again, two very different stories. In one case, he is accosted by a much bigger man who'd been drinking since daybreak and, and he only shot in self-defense. And the other story is he walked up to an unarmed man and shot him in the back. Again, you don't know the first-hand accounts, people who claim to be there on both sides that tell a very different story. But what happened was he did kill a man who, who was a, a government worker who had been a unionist and he was put in jail. This jail was on the um, close beside the Dickinson property where the First Baptist Church is now. He was sprung out of jail that night by a mob and he was hanged on a tree that is um, indicated in some of the old photographs on the Dickinson property. And he was one of the very last people to be buried in First Presbyterian Cemetery downtown. And um, it was, uh, there was a lot of violence actually after the war, as you can imagine, veterans from both sides coming back to Knoxville. And in, this incident actually influenced a lot of um, former Confederates. Um, many did not return to Knoxville immediately after the war um, and did come back eventually. But this, uh, this event was one that, uh, that influenced the decision of many of the former Confederate soldiers. Now, this one, State's View. This is at the top of uh, Ebenezer, yeah, right where You'll see it. Isn't that nice? Do you ever wonder what it was? It's one of those you, th you think is, ah, it has a story. I just don't, can't quite remember what it is. Well, it was built by Charles McClung. It was built by Frank H. McClung's grandfather, but it was actually sold in the 1830s to a man named Heiskell. So during the war, it was not owned by the McClungs, and I've never heard anything about it. So if anybody has any Civil War stories to go along with this, uh, this particular structure, let me know. That's a, it's a fascinating structure. It's, it's got its own historic architectural, uh, there is an architect, known architect who helped with it, and, and of course people who know architecture, which I do not know, but it's, it's an important uh, early structure. Anyway, that's what it looks like. Well, they, they put the traffic light in the bedroom window, which is a nice <laughs> touch. 
you can imagine the room changes color about every time. <laughs> anyway, now we're going to follow Longstreet uh, and the Confederate Army. He's, he has with him McLaws, Hoods, and Buckner's divisions, and they have missed their chance at Campbell Station, and they're moving down the road. And this is now November 1863. The Battle of Campbell Station is the uh, 16th or 17th? 16th, thank you. Um, and there is General James Longstreet. And we hear that he had his headquarters at first at the Reynolds House, which is on Kingston Pike. Um, we have here from Dr. J.G.M. Ramsey's biography, in, and Ramsey was traveling with Longstreet, that uh, he um, met with um, Long's, he actually met with Longstreet at the Reynolds House, and he looked at Longstreet's map and said, that's wrong, your, your river does not come in. The French Broad does not come into the east of town, it comes into the west. And Longstreet did, refused to believe him. And that made a huge difference. That meant that during the siege that Knoxville was getting supplied from Sevier County, the, the troops were, uh, there was a man named Doherty, Colonel Doherty, who was in charge, he was in the local a local man who was in the Union Army, and he was getting those provisions in. Under the cover of darkness on rafts, they were sending food in so that the Union Army was, would not starve. That's what a siege is all about, obviously. The uh, one army's inside, and the, it's encircled by, encircled by the other, and they're trying to starve them out and make them surrender. Um, in any case, Longstreet would not listen to Ramsey, which is not as surprising as it might seem. In, again, in this war, when you could be on either side, but just by declaring which one you're, if you're not in uniform, it's really not easy to tell. Um, and the Confederates and the Union were both got huge amounts of false information by civilians who were helping one side or the other. So it's really not surprising that Longstreet might not pay attention to, to a native when he, when he tells him where the river is. At any rate, Ramsey had five sons in the Confederate Army, one who was killed, his 17-year-old son was killed. And uh, several, uh, one or two of these sons were with Longstreet, and he managed to have a little conference with his son at uh, the Reynolds House. And he said, late at the night of the same day, I left Lenore as I reached General Longstreet's headquarters, the house of Judge R.B. Reynolds. This is the place on Kingston Pike, up at the top of the hill bes behind the uh, restaurants that, that are there now. Amazing view from the top of that hill. And uh, of course, that's what you want when you're commanding general. So he stopped here. Um, and I, I hear there is some controversy as to whether or not it was really a headquarters or maybe he just stayed there for a night. But in any case, I think he did stay there. But uh, he, ha he is there because our uh, now General Sanders is holding back the entire Confederate force. He has uh, his dismounted troopers on Kingston Pike, and they are uh, holding the, the, uh, the Confederate force back while his while Sanders' friend and classmate, Orlando Poe, is getting everybody to finish digging. Apparently, when those tired soldiers came in after the Battle of Campbell Station, everybody got handed, they had two hours sleep, and then they got handed a shovel or a tin pan or anything that could dig. And, so, and Poe said to him, dig for your lives. This is, this is the way that we are going to win this. And it turned out to be the way they did win it. Um, so in any case, we're now moving down Kingston Pike to the home of Robert and Louise Armstrong. Um, when they were married, the land was for the house came from Drury Armstrong, who was his father, and the money to build the house from her, from her father. So it was a wedding present to them. Um, it was named after the Dickens novel, Bleak House. And, whoops. And um, Mrs. Armstrong was in the house during the artillery barrage. This house became uh, Longstreet's headquarters after uh, he left Reynolds House. And... This is an 1858 photograph of Bleak House. It's now owned by the Daughters of the Confederacy. And this is what it looks like today. It's now Confederate Memorial Hall. They're very, this is very well documented. The um, cannon shot in the walls and the pictures of the, of the uh, sharpshooters in the tower um, and the stories that are told about this. It's very, very rich in, in historic record. And this is Mrs. L Mrs. Armstrong. 
Her name was Louise Franklin. She was from Jefferson County. Uh, her sister married Dr. John Mason Boyd, and if anybody's heard my lectures on the Blunt Mansion and the Boyd family during the war, he was the eldest son of, of the Boyd family. She was inside the, the house when the, when the artillery barrage was going on. They told her to stay in an upstairs bedroom. And in the 1890s, when the Blue and Gray reunion happened, she was a very gracious hostess to both sides. They came to visit. Uh, in fact, Longstreet was, at that time, made an honorary 79th Highlander. Stra very strange set of circumstances after a war. It's like, oh, what a lovely war. You know, we'd come back and have a party and talk about the time we were killing each other. But at any rate, this is, she's a lovely lady. Her daughter... Uh, married a man named Lutz, L-U-T-Z. I understand that's the correct pronunciation, and uh, ha has had the other home on uh, across Kingston Pike with the swirly fence. That's post-Civil War, but it's the same family. Now, Robert Houston uh, Armstrong, this is Louise's husband. Uh, he was a lawyer, a politician. He does not seem to have been here during the war. He was um, almost certainly a Confederate sympathizer, although the voting records say before the war he voted against secession, but a lot of people did and then wore pro-CSA pro afterwards. Um, Drury Armstrong, the Battle of Armstrong Hill that we talk about on the south side of the river, he owned all that land, and that's why that was called Battle of Armstrong Hill. Um, but also, the hill across from Crescent Bend, where Sanders was killed, is sometimes called Armstrong Hill, which makes it a little bit confusing. But he, they, the Armstrongs owned own that land also. Um, Drury, was, he was dead by 1858, but he came from a large family, and his sister was married to Samuel Morrow, who lived downtown across the street from Ellen Renshaw House. And at any rate, the last time I talked about uh, downtown families, the, she has that wonderful diary called A Very Violent Rebel. She talks about the Morrow family a lot because they were unionists and they, they, they had issues and they were across the street neighbors. But Mrs. Armstrong was uh, the sister of Drury Armstrong. So the Armstrong family was mostly Confederate, but the Morrows were very strongly unionist. Now, Crescent Bend, this is a beautiful home. I love the school bus out there. It's nice to know. I mean, if so many of our historic homes are have excellent education programs and are, it's, a, it's a part of the uh, give back to the community. And of course, Crescent Bend has, a, has a, a, a wonderful story. This was Drury Armstrong's home. But, and there's Drury. Isn't he impressive? I like that cape and the, uh, General James Brevard Kershaw and the Palmetto, Palmetto Sharpshooters from South Carolina. This is Kershaw. He stayed in Crescent Bend during the Civil War. And he, during his stay here in town, and it was his troops that manned the trenches that were just found on what, what they're calling uh, Morgan Hill. But that Morgan, it was the uh, Harcourt Morgan, who was the first president of UT. And, but it's where all the sororities are going in. There the, we excavated the Confederate trenches there, found pottery, uh, Edgefield pottery that's South Carolina and Georgia. We know the troops were from South Carolina and Georgia. The, Artillery was from Georgia. So it was a very nice uh, commingling uh, co of the, what we thought we knew and the facts. You know, sometimes what we think we know and the facts are not, uh, don't necessarily line up. But in this case, it did. So this was the man who stayed in Crescent Bend. And it was from that artillery position that the opening shots of uh, the assault of Fort Sanders happened. Now, this one, I'm going to end with this. And this is one of those stories that I heard when I first got here, that the Lonus family actually changed their name, that they were so upset that one side spelled their name with an E and one side spelled their name with an A after the Civil War. And I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm still looking at that. When you look at Rule's history, there are wonderful histories of Knoxville. One is by a man named Rule, who published in, in 19, 1900. Um, he lists a, a Jacob Lonis, who, who uh, was is here as early as 1794. And then there's a Joseph Lonis, who was uh, probably the man at Dowell Springs. And then Dowell Springs for sure had CSA wounded in 1863, so we know that that's true. But there was also a Jacob K. Lonis with an E, who was a Union cavalry captain. This is what uh, Rule says. There was a Jacob L. Lonis who was a Confederate soldier, and this was in Seymour's book. And luckily, there are some living descendants we could consult about all these. But both spellings, 
are here. I don't know how well this shows up. Are here. We've got L O N E S and L O N A S who live side by side. So I don't. I and they ought to, If you look at the ages of the first two people who are the parents, and then you look at the children's ages, it's possible that that's a son. And and there are yet two different spellings of the name Lonus. Now here we've got an Elizabeth Lonus A S and a Henry Lonus with an E S on the same page. And here a Jacob Lonus, who in 1850 was 8, so by 61 he's going to be 19 years old. He is probably this guy. His name in 50 is spelled with an ES. His name in 61 is spelled with an AS. And then there's this guy, who is Jacob L. Lonus. So we've got Jacob K. in the Union and Jacob L. in the Confederacy. This is confusing. This is very confusing. I, I think there were the two, I, if anybody was going to spell their name differently, you'd think it would be these two guys who are probably cousins, but maybe not. Um, and they have the two different spellings of their names. So I'm not sure. And here's Mr. and Mrs. William Baker Lonis with an A-S, and he was in the CSA. So maybe it was the next generation who changed their names. And if there are any Lonus descendants here who could figure this out for me, I would love to have that kind of information. Uh, it's, uh, at, at this point, I don't know if that change in the spelling had anything at all to do with the Civil War, but it's certainly a good story, and I think it's one we've all heard. Forks in the Road, to make it even more complicated, we hear about the houses, right? There was one called Forks in the Road. This belonged to Jacob and Jane. And it's where Weston Plaza shopping is. Jacob died in 47, and Jane was killed here on October 63 by a Union soldier as she was protecting her garden. I think most people have heard that story. This is what the home looked like, and it was uh, demolished whenever Western Plaza Shopping Center went in, which is right there by Lyons, uh, Lyons View Road on Kingston Pike. But this is the Dowell Springs. And this one, I'm not, I won't show the big map, this one is on the two Lonus's houses, that one that I just showed you, Fork in the Rose, and this Dowell Springs house are both on Poe's map. And this is the one, that's, it's a beautiful house. I just took this picture last week. And Knox Heritage has been involved. This property is available. And it is, it is just a, a, a lovely home, and always was, and was almost certainly used for Confederate prisoners, uh, Confederate um, patients. And we do know that two of the colonels, Confederate colonels who died during the Battle of Fort Sanders were buried in a Lonus family cemetery. So certainly there's that Confederate connection. And it's this one, Lyons Mill. This is not Lyons Mill. <laughs> this was actually put in in the 20s, I think, for uh, the Westmoreland, uh, a new subdivision back then. But it's a beautiful little location when the water, and today it was lovely with, the, with all of the foliage. I'm going to show you one more, Knox, North Knoxville, so that you don't think I'm just doing west. This is Stevens Mortuary, and um, it was on Broadway on Oglesworth, actually. It's now uh, a funeral home, but it was, of course, a, a a very early house. It is on that Poe map, and um, some very reliable sources tell me there are bullet holes in the wall. I haven't been out there to look at them, but we know that Sanders folk came down T Taswell Road. There may have been firing, but it's not just this west, uh, west corridor that has Civil War connection. Uh, quickly, quickly, I have nobody stood up to leave yet. I'll do this very quickly. I, I hate to get all this material together and not give it to you, but Mabry Hazen House. Um, this is, we all know about this one. This is, of course, in East Knoxville. I'm going to tell you about poor Laura Churchwell Mabry. The Churchwells lived out north uh, near the uh, Ogles, the Ogle or uh, the, what was the family home? I forgot it now. The Stevens Mortuary. And she married uh, Joseph A. Mabry II. And this lady, had 14 children altogether, starting in the, in the 50s. Their children were too young to fight. Six of their children died in childhood, and not just as infants. These were two- and three-year-olds. Um, two of her adult sons were murdered in different incidents a year apart. Uh, one of her children died at 17 and one at 28, and then three of them lived till their 80s, and one of them died at age 97. She had her first child at 20 and her last child at 46. She spent the entire war pregnant, and you wonder, 
You know, and the house is full of soldiers. The first half of the war, it's full of Confederate soldiers. The second half of the war, it's full of Union soldiers. And I, I just, you, I can't imagine what life was like for this poor woman. But she survived. Her daughter, this is Alice, one of those children that survived into their 80s, um, married a man named Hazen. So this was Alice Mabry Hazen. That's where the name Mabry Hazen comes from. And this is the mother of Evelyn, who died in the 1980s. And this is James. He's a junior. He, d he actually was born out on Kingston Pike at that Mabry house where his brother, George Washington Mabry, lived. Um, he was called the general for the rest of his life after the war because of the money he donated. It's interesting how a military rank can be bestowed, but uh, he, he, he outfitted Mabry's graves. This is his son, James A. Mabry III. The two of those guys were in a brawl. Apparently, they had another son named William who was uh, murdered. And they got into a brawl with the murderer, and the murderer and his son were killed at that point. And these, these two were not found guilty. But a year later, there was another incident with a man named Thomas O'Connor. And this was the famous incident down on Gay Street, where O'Connor shot Elder Dead. Um, and then there are a couple of versions uh, when, uh, as to what happened next. But the uh, son heard about it. He raced over. He shot. O'Connor, and either O'Connor shot him before he died, or there was a friend with O'Connor who shot him. But at any rate, Mabry, husband, and son are now dead on Gay Street. This poor lady up at Mabry Hazen House, who has everybody dying around her, she now has two more murders in the family. And so that's what happened. Thomas O'Connor definitely killed uh, the elder. Then he was killed by the younger, and then somebody killed the younger. So there are three murders on Gay Street. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop now because I'm going on way too long. But no, you want me to go? <laughs> Keep going? <laughs> all right, all right. There is, this does actually come to a conclusion at some point. All right. This is <laughs> this beautiful park house that was the Confederate, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Knox. Academy of Medicine for many years. And this is an old photograph, and look how good it looks today. This is a real success story when it comes to historic preservation. Um, uh, Mr. Clausen uh, with the uh, railroads, you can see we've got this nice railroad uh, signal here, uh, was responsible for this. And you know, the whole block here was Whittle Communications, and yet they managed to save the Bijou Theater, which is another great success story, and this beautiful home. The Park family. They were one of the very earliest families. And they, uh, remember I said one of the uh, bakers, the early bakers married into the Park family. They married Armstrongs and Parks and Boyds and Masons. They were all, and, and I, I finally come to the conclusion that my amazement that everybody was related is, is, is just a coincidence of time. If I only thought about it, of course they're all related. Who else are they going to marry? There's nobody else out here. <laughs> It's the frontier, and there are a certain select few that people that exist, and they have large families, and of course they marry each other. But 1860 to six, 61 to 65, this is a town of relatives. They are all intermarried, and of course that's the old families. The new family, the incoming population, there are only 4,000 people anyway, but there are a lot of newcomers. There are a lot of immigrants. There are Irish and Swiss and German, and those people are different altogether because the old families own, I think it's like 10% of the population controls 65% of the wealth. It's, it's, a, it's very much, a, it's a very small kernel of old families, but they are all related, and the Park family is definitely part of that. Um, they were so, one of the parks was with the deaf and dumb asylum, uh, the uh, uh, doctor administrator there. First Presbyterian Church, the um, same, it was James the first and the second. When you read it, it seems like James uh, Park, when you read the family history, lived for about 200 years. It turns out there were two of them, and they both lived very long lives. Um, and they were Confederate sympathizers, and there's a nice little article where a daughter uh, reports that her father tried to convince Longstreet that the French Broad River came in north of town. And just like the other time, he said, no, nope, no, nope, I got a map. <laughs> My map shows me where it is. Anyway, Craighead Jackson House. This is right beside Mabry Hazen, and I don't know anything yet about it. I, was, I really thought by this time I'd have run out of time, so I didn't do too much. But I love this old picture, and it's, par it's on the property beside Blunt Mansion. And I know they're going to be doing... They are working on it, and the story of, that, of those people in that time will be interpreted. 
And of course, Blunt Mansion, I think. Now this, uh, sometimes I think uh, well, I've already given this lecture about Blunt Mansion, but it may be that it was at the end of the program and I never got there. So the Blunt Mansion story, Civil War story with Bell Boyd coming to visit and the officers um, going to the house there for the musical evenings and the piano being taken from a Confederate family and given to the Boyd family. Um, these are wonderful stories that are going to be part of the interpretation at the Boyd Mansion. And this building, this hasn't changed. You see the soldiers up here on the roof? And they used to think that these were stacked rifles. And then on closer examination, someone said, I think they're just bean poles. But in any case, you've got soldiers. And it's also speculated that these, this was after Lincoln's assassination, and these are mourning wreaths. But if you look at that today, it, it's the same beautiful building. All right, that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I'll take one or two questions. Yes, question. What's the answer? Why was Cedar Grove there? Uh, the I, I, I don't know. It's Oliver Smith is listing it. So you might call Oliver Smith says that he's the, he's the agent. Don't know. I hope so. All right. Thank you. I know it's been long, so. <laughs>